This morning we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 33, starting with verse 10. And the last time we kind of went halfway through and we stopped, um, then we're going to finish 33 and, and really go through these two chapters topically. Um, what we're going to do is Isaiah, as we get towards the part about the Messiah, we're going to slow it down. We're going to take the chapters and break them apart a little bit more. Uh, so what we can do is we can look at these and how do I apply my faith? How With the proof of the resurrection, the proof of prophecy, the proof that Jesus is the Messiah, all these things are in the scripture. And we're going to get to that in Isaiah. Isaiah is a very important and pivotal book. But until then, we're actually going to look at Again, the title is called Contrasting Cultures. Uh, this is part two. And we see the backdrop or the context of, you know, we're before 701 BC in the Middle East, uh, Israel, and uh, she's being threatened by a kingdom called Assyria, which came before, actually, it was Syria, then Assyria, then Babylon. And then as we get to the Persians, Greeks, and Romans, we, we kind of understand where we're at and get our bearings. But they are coming down, and they're going to be surrounding Jerusalem, and the people are, are upset. But there's three types of cultures that are going on at the time. And what's interesting is today, you can look at anything that's going on in the world, and you can take those same issues in the world and apply them to the, what the Scripture says about cultures. And we had the culture of the world. The Assyrians were threatening everybody. Uh, the Babylonians were on the rise next. And today we could look at cultures too. You know, we wasn't that long ago we had World War I, World War II. Uh, dictators rise up and they're hell-bent on world domination. So you've got the culture of the world. The second culture is interesting. This was the Jerusalem culture. Whether you look at the Old Testament or the New Testament, it was very clear that all those who were in Jerusalem had the accoutrements of religion and the temple and all those wonderful things. Not everybody's heart was right with God. And today, we can also make the application for believers in the Christian culture. There's a lot, you know, supposedly Christianity claims one billion adherents, but we know through the scripture, whether it's the, uh, the mustard seed that grows into this dominating tree or Jesus' parable of the wheat and the tares, everything that calls itself Christian is not Christian. My son told me an interesting and sad, sad story. When he was on campus, this group came in and they had some name and uh, they were a college campus group, and they had all these placards, and it was weird, you know. They were saying kind of hateful things and just weird stuff that really has nothing to do with the Scripture. Like one of the placards was, uh, a woman's place is in the kitchen. I mean, like, where do you get that from? But my, my, my son, who's a believer, wanted nothing to do. He, like, <laughs> he went to the library, and him and another girl were kind of watching it through the window, and um, they were kind of saying, well, this isn't really representative of Christianity. So it was a kind of weird group. There's cults out there. There's all kinds of things. So we can take the situation back then and make application today. Now, the last culture is really the, the true believers, the godly remnant. Whether it was in Jerusalem, they were praying, they had a relationship with the Lord. Hey, it's not for us to judge. Jesus said, don't judge. Only God can see into the heart to know if we truly are believers or not. And it's not an elite club because anybody can believe at any time. Uh, in the New Testament, you just have to trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you're good. He died for your sins. We, we pray. We have a relationship with God. And it's an awesome thing. So we're going to look at these contrasting cultures. I'm going to make some applications today. And we're going to take this in six parts. So let's check it out in chapter 33, verse 10. God says, Now I will rise, says the Lord. Now I will be exalted. Now I will lift myself up. You, meaning the Assyrians, shall conceive chaff. You shall bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. And the people shall be like the burnings of lime, like thorns cut up. They shall be burned in the fire. Hear, you who are afar off what I have done, and you who are near acknowledge my might. So one out of six is, well, God has moved to action. Now, if we pick up our history books, we know that there was a 701 um, besiegement of Jerusalem by a king named Sennacherib. Whether it's in the scripture or secular sources, this is all confirmed. Whether it's scripture or secular sources, we also know that they never got in. That was like the only city they could never get into. Well, because the Bible gives us details. God annihilated a really large part of their army overnight. So they, they turned tail and they 
they, they didn't have enough troops to get in. They, they were an evil army. They were sort of like the, the Nazis' quest or the, the communist takeovers. Uh, they were horrible, and God just kind of left their plans to nothing. But God responds to the pleas from the godly remnant. Remember, that culture of true believers. So what we do is we left off with this uh, trialogue, right? There's the dialogue, and then there's this trialogue, and, and you see God speak, and then you see the the godly remnant speak. It's kind of neat how you, you see it's, you're watching a conversation as you read in the scripture, and then you even see the, the Jerusalem culture speak because they didn't trust God and, and their failures in, in, in denying God and trying to do it their own way. So you see this kind of colloquy, this kind of situation that's going on. Um, but God says in verses 11 through 12 that he says to the Assyrians, you're going to give birth stubble, chaff, you know, your desire to kill more people and dominate another city, he tells them before this happens, it's not going to happen because I'm going to stop you. Uh, Verse 13, what God did actually spread to all the nations, and this was common. It's funny because in Acts chapter 8 in the New Testament, Philip, one of the Lord's followers, runs into this Ethiopian treasurer who's in the area at the time, and um, God puts him in the right place at the right time, and the Ethiopian treasurer, different culture, different land, he's reading the scroll of Isaiah, and Philip asks him, you understand what you're reading? And Philip asked him to come help him to interpret the scripture. He was interested in God's word. So the cool thing is God's word way back when, and even today, spreads to all cultures. It's a unifying force. It's a big umbrella. It's beautiful. So the good news and also the bad news, when God said to the nations, hear what's going to happen, hear what I'm going to do to that wicked nation, and everybody got the picture. As a matter of fact, we see in other part of scripture that other nations, Gentile nations, sent gifts to Jerusalem after they saw how God wiped out the Assyrians. They were happy about that too because the Assyrians were harassing everyone. So you can see this, there was even, believe it or not, a global community back then. It's not just today. Verse 14 continues, it says, the sinners in Zion, right, in Jerusalem, they're afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He who walks uprightly. So you got to watch in between each verse. There's like a question and answer. There's a Q&A going on. He who walks up, uh, walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed. This would be great to be reading to Washington, D.C. You know, you guys, you better be careful because God sees all the little dirty dealings that you do with your positions of power and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He will dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Your I, th- I think I need to stop there. <laughs> I'm getting excited. You know, I'm, I'm running ahead of myself. But uh, two out of six is that this just culture of Jerusalem, uh, there's wicked people in there. And they had, a, again, a pretense of religion, a pretense uh, of knowing God, but, they, but God knew their hearts. And basically, God had to judge the wicked Gentile nations, but he also judged his own people. Right? There's a lot of people who don't understand that. Well, does God, well, they hear God's chosen people. Well, they were chosen for a purpose. Does God play favorites? Absolutely not. The same dealings with sin on the outside also had to be dealt with on the inside. And even that's repeated in the New Testament. Judgment starts with the house of God. And sometimes we get disciplined because we're not doing the right thing. So, but you, but you see this is um, in Hebrews, uh, it speaks about, I'm sorry, Hebrews 12:29. It also says in the scripture in the New Testament that our God is a consuming fire. So when we look at all these verses about burnings and everlasting fire, our God is uh, a consuming fire. Well, how do we escape judgment? It's very simple. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I'm going to be talking to you this morning about the future and, and Armageddon and all that kind of stuff. And you might say, well, who can be saved? Those who turn to Christ and trust him as their Lord and Savior. I mean, I did a study on Revelation. People are, I used to be afraid of Revelation before I knew the Lord. 
But then I got to know the Lord, and I'm like, oh, revelation, apocalypsis. It means revealing, the revealing of Jesus Christ. People have taken that transliterated word, make it, making it apocalyptic, and it, there's a word today that we've changed in our vernacular. Instead of the revealing of Jesus, apocalypse is scary, it's end times, it's frightening, it's World War III. But the bottom line is God's got it covered. If you're in Christ, there's these things you don't have to worry about. So that I want to make very clear. Christ died for our sins, and that's how we escape, by trusting in that sacrifice. Um, the other question, or the other point here, was the wicked ones, or the hypocrites, or the sinners in Zion, everybody's a sinner, but these people were blatantly anti-God, although they had the umbrella of God's people. I mean, how many times you read in the newspaper of some religious figure that does like horrible things and you, you're like well that can't be a person of God but they wear certain vestments and they have certain titles and it's really a black eye to Christianity because you know you, I would put them in this category if you really knew God how could you do such horrendous and heinous things on a repeated basis um, remember everything that states that it's Christian is not necessarily Christian we have to understand that the other thing is, again, they were in the seat of religion in Jerusalem, uh, but they weren't saved because they didn't have a relationship with God, right? Um, religion doesn't save. Only Christ saves. And in the Old Testament, you had to believe and have faith in God. Number one, Abraham, Moses, they had faith and belief that God was going to send the Messiah. So when Christ died, he died for their sins too, even though it was kind of retroactively, so to speak. In verse 15, it says, God answers really their question, who can be saved? Well, you, you know, you have to be upright. You have to be honest. Again, not perfect, not sinless. We have to make that clear. But this was a lifestyle of bribery and corruption. And, you know, when you give a, a man or a woman power and you keep them in that place of power a long time, these things happen. It's like the, the old expression, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, it's very hard when you get into those situations, you, you, you kind of you revert to the flesh. But if somebody's truly a believer, um, many examples of believers who had wealth but were upright people, they weren't corrupt um, because they had God in their life, and that's very important. Verse 17, we continue. He says, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. Your, your heart will meditate on terror. Where is the scribe? Where is he who weighs? Where is he who counts the towers? You will not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception, of a stammering or unintelligible speech or tongue that you cannot understand. And this was a really a picture of when the foreign nations came and they invaded, and sometimes they had a language or a dialect that the God's people couldn't understand, and they were frightened. And there would, there would be guys that would be scribes writing down. They would count the towers, and they would decide how they were going to invade and just cause so much suffering. But this is going to be a thing of the past. Look upon Zion, Jerusalem, the city of our appointed feasts. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that will not be taken down. This is the future. Not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there the majestic Lord will be for us, a place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley with oars will sail, nor majestic ships pass by. So he's using maritime examples in his, in his euphemisms or his metaphors. Um, again, when you go through the prophetic books, it takes a little bit to get the hang of it. Oh, okay, he just changed subjects again. Oh, he's using another metaphor. I get it. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. Very important because the people were following earthly and human leaders, and God was saying, well, let's, we got to put this in perspective. He will save us. Your tackle is loose. They could not strengthen their mass. They could not spread the sail. Then the prey of great plunder is divided. The lame take the prey, and the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. So three is the encouragement to the godly culture who trust in God, and also a look to future Jerusalem. So our understanding, when we read um, Ezekiel, when we read Isaiah, when we read Revelation, when we read the New Testament, the Gospels, Jesus elaborating on this stuff, we know that when Christ comes again, he will reign from Jerusalem. He will be the perfect king. He will be, uh, it's amazing that what it says here, he will be the 
three branches of government that we have, right? The, he'll be the executive, he'll be the king, he'll be the judicial, he'll be the legislative. Now, our founders were smart enough to separate that in the United States. So you look at a lot of these monarchies in England and even uh, in, in ancient Israel, and the sad thing is the people would groan when a bad king would come into power because y y there was no checks and balances. The beauty of our country, even though it's not perfect, is there's three co-equal branches of government. So there's checks and balances. But when the Lord comes, he will inhabit all of those. He will make the laws. He will enforce the laws. He will, he's the righteous judge. He will decide on cases. And he's also the executive. He's the king. And as believers, when we understand the scripture, we look forward to this. Because whether it's New Jersey or the county we live in or the town or the country, people have gripes about politicians. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't want to say that Jesus will be a politician because it's got a negative connotation, but he will be the king ruling from Jerusalem. And there will be a point where there'll be this, this peace. There won't be any more invasions. There won't be any more wars. There's a lot of people who are going to be out of business in this beautiful millennial kingdom in our future probably won't need soldiers, probably won't need cops, probably won't need a lot of people because the Lord has fixed a lot of those things why today we need those types of people. So um, sorry, some of us will be unemployed, but uh, I don't think we're going to be paying taxes either. That's just my <laughs> the idea, so don't sweat it. Uh, food will be abundant. All right? That's good. <laughs> you know, it's funny because uh, this is why people who are against God look at this sometimes and say, well, it's a fairy tale, because it literally is too good to be true in their eyes. But it is true. You know what I'm saying? God isn't going to let human history just keep doing this and going down this road. Eventually, he's going to stop it. Plus, we have the equipment today with nuclear technology, and it's spreading to all these nations that um, it just takes one hothead, and the earth could be turned into this big conflagration. Um, and actually, if you look at Revelation, you'll see a lot of these burning fires and a lot of these things before God remakes the entire heaven and earth. So you do see some instability that I'm going to cover today as well. Uh, but we, we go through this, and it says that, uh, verse 17, that their eyes and our eyes will see the beauty of the king. Now, this is fascinating because we're going to get to the part of Isaiah where it says when the Messiah comes... He will have no form or comeliness that we should desire. So if you looked at, everybody's got a picture of Jesus. You know, there's all different ethnic Jesuses, uh, you know, the pasty Jesus, the Jesus with the halo. I mean, it's just, you're like, well, what does he look like? Well, according to the scripture, if you actually saw him in his actual form, in his face, in his flesh, when he walked the earth, you'd be like, oh, you wouldn't be impressed. Well, he doesn't look like a celebrity. Well, he could use a little bit of makeup or, you know. Because the, the point wasn't his appearance. The point was his character and his heart. He was God in the flesh. So when we see the, be the beauty, we see this again. It, it is, we're not going to be drawn to him because he's beautiful. We're going to be drawn to his character. God's character is beautiful. I mean, you ever uh, experience a situation where somebody, I don't know, you, would, you put them at a 10, beautiful, male or female, and then they start talking and they're just, their character is just so so decadent that you, you, you actually look at their appearance differently. You know what I'm saying? And, and unfortunately, as humans, and we shouldn't do this, um, humans judge by appearance, but God does not. God doesn't have to be beautiful for us. However, he is beautiful in character. So this is going to be an exciting time. Um, everybody with their pictures of Jesus, when he comes and they, you know, they're going to throw their pictures away and go, he's just wonderful. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter what he looks like at this point. Uh, verses 18 through 23, again, the maritime analogy, um, a lot of times the uh, ships would come in from foreign powers, and it would be terrifying. You'd have your scouts, they'd look out, and you could see all the boats, warships coming. But according to this, they're going to be confounded. It's not going to happen again. There's going to be no more war, according to the scripture. Um, so that's pretty neat. Verses 23 through 24, again, uh, Jerusalem will be a a, a, a solid bulwark. It'll be the Lord Jesus' at head, headquarters where he rules the world from. Again, so there's not going to be... So he's telling the people back then, there's going to be problems. You know, yeah, the Assyrians are going to go away, but then the Babylonians are going to come, and then the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. But 
you know, you're always going to be my people. There's going to be trouble in this world, Jesus says. But he says, I have overcome the world. You just got to follow my timetable, so to speak. Um, but you look at something in here about a lack of sickness. A lack of sickness. Uh, probably was a pointing, and remember, this is pre-Jesus Christ uh, coming in the flesh. It probably was pointing to the first century when Christ came. And he, like I said, he couldn't, he couldn't pass a blind person that he didn't heal. I mean, he couldn't pass a lame person that he didn't stop and help them get up and walk on their feet. Uh, so, again, we have the, the blessing of 2,000 years of the Scripture of the New Testament. We're, going, we're talking B.C. So they had to have a, a picture. They had to have an understanding of the Messiah to come. They also had to have an, uh, an understanding of his second coming and what will be going on in that beautiful millennial kingdom that we all look forward to. Okay? Verse 5. Excuse me. Next chapter. It says, come here, you nations, to hear, and heed, you people. But let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all things that come from it. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations because of the wickedness that they were practicing. And his fury against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to the slaughter. And their slain shall be thrown out. Their stench shall rise from their corpses and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine, and as fruit f falling from a fig tree. So uh, verses 1 through 4 in chapter 34 is, 4 out of 6 is woe to the ungodly nations. And again, you can see references to Assyria, but I'm going to take us to some of the, the battles that are actually in in earth's future from 2018 so some of these things are future pictures uh, the lord almost saying to those that were listening well it's going to get worse before it gets better you know i have a timetable i'm going to eradicate human leadership sinful human leadership but these things are going to happen and jesus spoke about the birth pangs you know they'll, they'll come on in frequency and intensity and then it'll be subdued then it'll it'll increase you know like uh, like birth pangs right like contractions uh Parallel in verses 11 through 21 in Revelation 19 regarding the goriness and the cataclysms, especially in verse 4 that we just read. Okay, so he says in, in verse 1, this is almost like, you know, God loves all people. It doesn't matter. You're in a group. Okay, he can address your group, but he can also address you as an individual. And he also is addressing the, the nations, don't go down this road. It's going to end up in judgment. You want to make war, you want to make these problems, I'm going to eventually humble you. He's also speaking, I believe, to the soldiers. Now, if you look at any major battle, wherever it was, there were people who were deserters, saying, you know what, I just... There were people on bad armies who deserted. You know, there were some in the Russian army. There were some in the German army. They, you see the statistics if you look it up. How many thousands of deserters they just took off. They went into the country or somewhere and burned their uniforms. So I, I believe God here is, again, it's a warning. Just because it's your group, it's your profession, it doesn't mean that you have to be a part of that because I'm going to judge that situation because of their witness, uh, wickedness. In verse 1, he says, Come, hear, heed. All right? He's speaking to those that are still making a decision. Do I want to follow this road, or do I want to follow that road? Come, hear, heed. Okay? And, and he says that today to us. There may be some here this morning who, oh, you're just not buying the whole God thing. You're not buying the whole Christian thing. God is trying to get your attention through this message. You know, he wants you, I'm going to get to the part where he says, test me, see if these things don't come to pass. That's what I love about God, is it's not blind faith, it's articulable faith. And I make that, that case in apologetics. But God judges, he has to judge sin on the earth, but he takes no pleasure in it, right? Because God's perfect. There has to be justice. There's really a lack of justice in this world. Still things going on that I can't believe after so many years that nations and human beings and organizations tolerate it right it's not good he has to judge sin and in his timetable he will 
Now, from my studies, there's two major battles that are going to come upon the earth, okay? There's the Armageddon, which is found really in Revelation. It encompasses really the world's armies. And you can see things heating up in different quadrants, who's aligning with who. We see it today. There's also the Ezekiel 38 and 39 battle, which is, I believe, is a different battle. It's limited to certain nations, and its design is to invade Israel. I believe Ezekiel 38 and 39 comes first. Now, if we can put up image one, put up image one of the map, this is where it's all going to happen. Hey, what about the United States? I, I got to tell you, folks, <laughs> when you read the scripture, this is where it started. This is where it's going to end. So what's going on today? Well, if you look at thir Ezekiel 38 and 39, some interesting things are happening today. And in the roughly 27, 2800 years since Ezekiel wrote this prophecy, we've never seen this until the last few years. So Syria today uh, has a few nations. Ezekiel 38 and 39 speaks about the Persians, one of the big aggressors. This is Persia. It's just now called Iran. Iran is over here, and Iran recently has been trading rockets and missiles with Israel's army across the Golan Heights. I know, I know, the media is focused on, did you hear Yanni or did you hear Laurel? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of you are like, what did he just say? Just look it up when we're done. But they're focused on nonsensical issues, but these are the things that can plunge humanity into a place of destruction. So you have Persia's over here, you have Russia, is over here. You have Turkey is now involved. You have Hezbollah. You have the Sheba and Dedan down here, not really wanting to physically get involved, but saying, hey, what's going on over there? Gets even more interesting. If you look at Iran's idea, there's two different types, well, there's a few different types of Islam, but the main ones are Sunni and Shiite. Uh, Iranians are Shiite, Syria mostly, and Hezbollah. So they've made this crescent across the top here. Down here, they're Sunni. There's some Sunni over here in Africa, there's some Shiite. If you follow, again, you won't see this in the mainstream media because they don't really do their homework anymore, but if you follow uh, eschatology, well, we believe the Messiah is going to come and he's going to make an everlasting peace and bring everything together. If, however, if you read al Jafar, which is the Shiite holy uh, books and writings, it says that <laughs> it says the Shiites must invade Jerusalem before the Mahdi comes, which is their last Messiah, okay? You're like, wow, where did all this stuff come from? But this is, this is fact, and we've accelerated the program by some years ago, boosting Iran with money and, and not watching what they were doing. So here we are, we're in this position. Iran um, sent rockets over the Golan Heights. Israel responded with warships, you know, and, and they uh, just started hitting them with missiles and blew up some of their camps and killed some of the Iranian soldiers. This problem isn't going to go away anytime soon, just so you know. Why do I say this? You see, I say it with a smile. You're like, well, he must be crazy. No, I say it with a smile because that means that pretty soon the Lord is going to come and he's going to remove his people from the earth and uh, he eventually will deal with the sin on the planet and set up his own utopia. It's all over scripture. It's in the Gospels. It's in the Old Testament. It all lines up. And the beautiful thing is, whosoever will come to Christ will be saved. And that's the beautiful thing. That's his clarion call. There are, in North Korea, uh, Christians. There's churches, although it's not legal. In China, there's uh, churches in Iran who are heavily persecuted. Um, but God's vision, his Holy Spirit, his, he, he's, he's stirring people up. There is a great, even with the, the persecution, according to the, there's a lot of reports on this, is getting to be worse than the Roman persecution. And we're in America. We turn on the TV, we hear news that has to do with us. We don't see what's going on in the rest of the world, okay? Everything is starting to fall into a prophetic place. It's actually very interesting. So some of the things I said, look it up. You can see this stuff for yourself. Okay, continuing on, verse 5. 
It says, For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. Again, these are uh, metaphors to this battle, and I'll get into that. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra, which is also Petra, which is in modern-day Jordan, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. The wild oxen shall come down with them, and the young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust saturated with fatness. For, the, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its stream shall be turned into pitch, and its dust into brimstone, and its land shall become burning pitch. It, is not, it shall not be quenched day or night. Its smoke shall ascend forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever, but the pelican and the porcupine shall possess it. Also the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch over it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call its nobles to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all its princes shall be nothing. And the thorn shall come up in its palaces, nestles and brambles in its fortresses, shall be a habitation of jackals, a courtyard for ostriches. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the jackals, and the wild goat shall bleat to its companion, and the night creature shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There the arrow snake shall make her nest and lay eggs and hatch and gather them under her shadow. There also shall, be, shall the hawks be gathered, every one with her mate. Now, we look at this and we, you know, what, what is the animals and their mating and the porcupines? And you have to remember, this is, this is a vernacular that's germane to the situation at hand. In other words, the people that Isaiah was speaking to, in so many years, they were going to see some of these fulfillments, and in great detail. Um, sometimes with these cults, you, you go to them, and they, they're very vague. Their prophecy is very vague. You ask them a question, they're very vague. God's word is very specific. And, and the rule of, of thumb is, for somebody who's going to lie, they have to be vague, so you don't corner them. God's word is very specific, and they were able to see some of these things happen exactly. There's a porcupine, there's, oh man, there's porcupines here. So again, for them, it was, it was literal, it happened to the T. For us, we get a general picture of what he's speaking about, so I don't want to lose anybody with that. But five out of six, and we have one more, is the Lord goes into detail warning the nation about desolation if they continue in rebellion. If you read about Babylon, Babylon the Great, you know, was it Nebuchadnezzar had the hanging gardens, and this was an incredible feat of irrigation and beauty and castles and gold, and who would have ever thought Babylon today would be desolate? Nobody in that time period. Their soldiers with their spears and their shields marching across the 30-something the, the foot walls, um, and, you know, you, if you were back then, you'd be like, this Babylon's going to last forever. God says, nah. Actually, today it's in a, a portion of Iraq. I, had, I showed pictures of it, and you can still see the walls. It's still a massive structure millennia later, but there's nobody in it except animals. <laughs> Isn't that neat? So God's word is it's always to the T. I want to read one more scripture to you, and then I want to explain it. <laughs> So Revelation 14, 17 through 20, again, this is a future time. This is a time that nobody has to be in. But, you know, it's Satan lies to human beings. So we're going to do a skit, Pastor Vinny and I, next Sunday. And it was a really great skit that was developed. And just to show how Isaiah 520, right will be understood as wrong, wrong will be understood as right. We're living in those times. There's so much deception that's out there. And Satan makes everybody believe that he's a party animal. He'll give you anything you want. He'll give you fun. He'll give you pleasure. But his design is to destroy you. God says, I have a better plan for you. You can have fun and pleasure, but you, you've got to follow my ways. You've got to trust in my son. Um, and you will be on that narrow road that leads to everlasting life. Satan is a liar. God is always true, but Satan tries to make people believe today that God is the cosmic killer of their fun, and that's just not the case. 
Um, I've never laughed so hard. I've never had so much freedom since I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. You know, I was a little bit of a downer back in the day, and my wife will agree to that. Uh, but it's a different, different you, you change. You just change your demeanor and everything. So Revelation 14, starting with verse 17, again, future occurrence on the earth. Nobody has to be here. People here choose to be here. It says, then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe, not in a good way. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs, or 184 miles. So the main thrust is that, is that eventually there will be this great day of the Lord's wrath. There will be the, the battle of, of Armageddon. And you may say, well, what about Edom? Why did, what was Edom? Who's Edom? Edom was a place and an archetype of those that are always trying to thwart God's will, that are always trying to harm God's people. And, you know, you see that in, in Esau and uh, Jacob and Esau, right? They had this history together. Jacob, although he did things that were wrong, was a man of faith and trusted the Lord. Edom or Esau was completely worldly. He really had no use for God. Now, Isaiah makes some comparisons, and I'll go through them briefly with these rebellious nations. Number one, he's saying that when this happens, it's going to be very bloody. It's going to be very, and it's just the way it's going to be. There's going to be wars and rumors of war, people attacking each other. It's just going to be, there's some movies that were made of this and some movies actually that did a good job of it. Just mass chaos, you know. Um, when I was a police officer, I, I was always saying, I, I can't wait. If this happens, I want to be raptured. I don't want to be there. It's going to be long shifts. We're going to be there for 20-hour shifts. So, and then when there was a disaster, you had to stay over. You didn't get much sleep. So it's going to be a horrible time on the earth. But again, it's, it's where the earth is heading. So it's going to be bloody. Um, instead of a sacrifice for sin, it's going to be a sacrifice because of sin. Hence the metaphors of the this, this, uh, the temple sacrifices. Two, it's going to be fiery judgment. Verses 9 through 11, comparisons are made. If you read into this, um, Sodom and Gomorrah, the great fires of Revelation 8 and Revelation uh, 16, and also the ultimate lake of fire. Um, three, the cities will result in desolation, which causes abandonment, which will only be inhabited by animals. And again, I've shown, I've shown pictures of some of these great kingdoms that no longer exist. Like incredible kingdoms that take up massive acreage. It's nobody there. There's weeds, there's growth, there's natural, and, and animals live there, and just like the Lord said that they would. Um, this happened in Babylon, which I talked about. Also, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah today, if you go to that area, it's desolate. It's salt. Um, it's a heavy salt and mineral content because God made it, he turned it into nothing. Um, again, even Basra or Edom, Petra, Jordan, and I've covered this as well. Um, the Edomites, who were, again, the archetype of those that were against God's people, they were pushed out of their place, their land, right, the Edomites, by the Nabataeans. The Edomites moved, um, moved north, excuse me, northwest to Edomia, which is in the Judah area, Eventually, these Edomites became the Herodians, hence you had that quintessential battle between Jacob and Esau end up with Jesus and the false Messiah, Herod, in the New Testament. It's amazing. So if you really follow all the leads in the scripture, you can't come to any conclusion, but this had to be a work of God. How did people, you know, we talk about collusion. People used to say collusion about the Bible. How do you get a bunch of people who never met each other, who spoke different languages, who lived in different time periods to collude on something that it's like this incredible conspiracy with so much detail, it's just not possible. People never even met each other, never lived at the same time, never lived even in the same culture. But you look at Ezekiel, you look at Isaiah, you look at Revelation, you look at the Gospels, and they all line up perfectly. 
You know what I'm saying? It's almost like when you put a, a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle together and you start putting all the pieces together, like, ah, I can see the image here. So I want you to make sure you understand that. Um, and, and this is what's going on. Listen, folks, this is, this is, I call it the heavy cream of the scripture. Listen, I like rich stuff. I like heavy cream, but these days when I eat it, I'm like, whoa, you know, I got to digest this, you know what I'm saying? So in the scripture, you have the light things, and we're going to get to those. You also have the heavy cream that you have to digest in your spirit. And you have to say, do I believe this? Or, or it's actually interesting. He's going into history. He's going into what's happening today. Even if you're a skeptic, you have to start now asking questions. You have to go on your quest for proof. Is this nonsense or is this truth? Right? First last two verses. Um, and again, he says in 33, 13, here, all those that are far off, he says in 34, 1, let the earth hear and all that is in it. Let the world and all things that come forth from it. So he keeps, he sends his couriers out there. Acts chapter 8, it went all the way down to Ethiopia and, you know, the continent of Africa. Uh, and they were reading the, the, in the first century the scroll of Isaiah, wanting to know what it said. So God's word will get out there. That's, that's definitely going to happen. Verse 16, last two verses, it says... Search from the book of the Lord and read. None, not one of these things shall fail. Not one shall lack her mate. For my mouth has commanded it and his spirit has gathered them. He has cast a lot for them and his hand has divided it among them with a measuring line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation they shall dwell in it. So six out of six is, and God does this a lot in his word. He challenges the skeptic. I love talking to atheists and scientists, and, you know, I really, I have fun. I like to debate. Um, honestly, if this was a fairy tale, I'm up here wasting my time. I could be doing a lot of other things. I, I'm not going to waste my time on something that's not true. So I love the, the skeptic. I, when someone says to me, well, I'm a skeptic, I'm like, we got to talk. Because I'm still waiting for the great argument, and it's not even, we're at an impasse. We, well, I heard this. Well, I read this. Well, well, let's look at that source. Let's follow the money. Let's follow these groups. Let's look at the ancient manuscripts. Let's look at archaeology. Let's look at science. Because God says it, challenge me. And, you know, every close to Resurrection Sunday, somebody comes up. I think they've quit. I think this year, nobody really came up with anything. One year, it was the Da Vinci Code. One year, it was the little, the little postage stamp piece of a nothing scroll that somebody said, this is going to do it. Really? How many words are on there? You know what I'm saying? Where did this thing come from? So, uh, you know, that was debunked, and I think this year nothing really came out, which that's good. But they just keep trying to put forth this stuff. Oh, I found the bones of Jesus. I found this. All right, well, let's, let's research this. Well, you know, I, I heard it from that guy, and, and well, that, that, we weren't sure if that was the actual, oh, come on, give me something that I can sink my teeth into. But he does that, and, and he says, I challenge you. I'm writing these, these down. Now, here's another thing, folks. This is important, especially if you're new to the word. Well, what about, remember, there's the Christian culture. There's the wheat and the tares, the good and the bad. And then there's true, true believers, the godly remnant. Well, what about, and this is a thing, <laughs> this one group, I'm going to pull my hair out. They keep predicting that Jesus is going to come back on this day and take everybody out of the earth, the rapture is going to come. And this is probably, their, I think they're on their 25th prediction. You know, it's another date. And I'm kind of working with the family, and I'm like, trust me, we'll be here the next day. You know, it's on Sunday. I'll see you on Monday. We'll talk, you know what I'm saying? Once you make one false prophecy, according, that's how, that's how strict God holds his prophets, because they're getting their information from him, and he doesn't make mistakes, and he knows the, the end from the beginning. He knows the future. So if one dude or one lady comes around and says, hey, this is going to happen tomorrow, and because God told me, and it doesn't happen, immediately that person has to be dismissed as a false prophet on God's own standards. Remember, he wrote the law. He wrote the rule book. And people are still following these groups. They're still on college campuses. They're still holding up placards. It's bizarre. That's not Christianity. Sorry. I'm not judging anybody's heart, but that as an organization is not Christianity because it goes against everything that the scripture says. Jesus said that every jot and tittle of the law will be fulfilled. Those little strokes in the Hebrew that, you know, all this stuff is going to be fulfilled in God's word. 
You know, I could just picture Jesus saying to the disciples, yeah, way back when, before I came to earth, we wrote it together. You know, I'm fully, fully God and fully man, but before that, I existed in eternity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Um, so last verse, basically, is that God has everything under control. He's going to make everything right. He's going to make everything just. Knowing this, folks, what category are we in? You might have come in today and said, well, I never even considered this. I guess I'm in the culture of the world. I'm still a skeptic. Okay, do your homework. Let's talk. You know, let's, let's get some books. Let's do some research. Because this period of time in Revelation and stuff, nobody's got to go through that. Not one person. It's a choice to go through it, turn their back on God, and eventually God says, time's up. I can't let this keep happening anymore. God's merciful and merciful. We're in the age of grace, but eventually the clock's going to run out. Second group is the Christian culture. In every church, there are people in the Christian culture, in the Calvary Chapel culture, in the Baptist culture. That doesn't mean that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. So, and again, I'll put our Calvary Chapel in that pot too. Plenty of people in Calvary Chapel that really don't know Jesus, but they love the church. And I'm talking about all Calvary chapels. And then there's the godly remnant. And again, it's not an elite club because everybody can be in that. But it's when you have, in a finite point in time, made a decision to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, to give him your heart, to give him your future, to give him your hopes and dreams. And most importantly, to say, my sins that I've committed, I trust that you've paid for them at the cross. I want the freedom that you're looking for. So at the end of the day, I don't care, this was written almost 3,000 years ago, it has an application for 2018 in the United States. But the choice is yours. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we, we love your word. It's powerful, it's good, it's so detailed. And uh, we love that you've just coordinated with so many people over a period of close to 2,500 years in several different languages, different cultures, different families, um, you know, people that didn't know each other. And they put it all together so that for those of us that are prodigals and, and thumbing our nose at God, that we would turn to you and find that peace and that shelter and that security that you speak about. So I just pray if there's anybody here who doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, that while the worship team leads us in worship, you might have seen it happen here before, but just come up, get up out of your seat, come to the front, and at the end of worship, I'll lead you in a prayer. Um, and if that's your heart's desire to trust Christ as your Lord and Savior, welcome to the family of God. There's no shame in the walk. It's an awesome thing. People will be clapping. But the Bible says that angels in, angels in heaven will be rejoicing. That's amazing. But most importantly, you get to start that journey with you and the one who created you. Come back. Come back. You come forward if that's your desire.